Fuck. Hello, Ryan. H Hello? <laughs> Alright, man, this isn't funny. Where am I? Look around you. I, I can't. I can't see anything. You see all things. <sighs> man, it's dark. It's dark as fuck in here. I can't see shit. You choose not to see. <laughs> no. There's no light, man. There's no light. Do you really think that? I... <laughs> okay, just please... Listen to me. I, I don't know where I'm at. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know who you are or what you want from me. I'm sorry if I wronged you in any way. But you can't just keep me here. You are keeping yourself here. <laughs> what? What? You are keeping yourself here. I... I don't want to be here, though. If you did not want to be here, you would not be here. I don't want to be here, okay? I have a lot of places I'd rather be than here. Okay, man, listen. There are people who are probably worried sick about me. I have appointments with people that I probably missed. They're probably wondering where I'm at. I have a lot of things to do. Do not worry about those things. You... You don't get it. I have a life. I, I need... Do not worry about those things. <laughs> what? Look, what do you want from me? Money? You want money? Oh god. Sex? Do you want sex? Okay, look, if you're gonna kill me, just do it. I'm not afraid of death. Just get it over with. You are afraid. That is why you are here. I don't know what you're talking about, man. I don't know why I'm here. You are here. To kill yourself. <laughs> what? What? What the fuck is this? A Saw movie? <laughs> Why? Do you want to play a game? <laughs> no, man, no. I, was, I just want to go home. Oh, little Dorothy wants to go back to Kansas. It is too late for that, little Dorothy. You are playing the game whether you realize it or not. <laughs> Alright, you know what? You know what? Fuck you. Fuck. You. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> Fuck your spirit, man. Fuck your spirit. <laughs> My spirit is your spirit, little Dorothy. Do you not see? <laughs> I told you, man. I can't see anything. I can't see anything. <laughs> what am I supposed to see? Such wasted potential. You will see when it is time. <laughs> time for what? Time for what? Hello? Hello? Hello?
supernatural activity and return forthwith to your place of origin or to the nearest convenient parallel dimension. That ought to do it. Thanks very much, Ray. Are you a No. Hey yo, from the haunted kingdom of Ohio, I am Ryan Peverly, your Halloween party host, and I ain't afraid of no ghosts. You're listening to Oculture's presentation of Trap or Treat 2. That's hashtag Trap or Treat 2 if you're following the show on the anti-social media. This is the second installment of a month-long thematic series that leads up to Halloween, the spookiest time of the year. And our spooks this time around are coming to us from the weird scene that is Hollywood, California, a town that may also be ran by some spooks, if you smell what I'm cooking. Just kidding, of course, we all know Hollywood is run by pedophiles. And our guest today may actually be able to confirm that. His name is Matt DeMille, and for the film buffs in the audience, yes, that DeMille, Matt will touch on his Hollywood bloodline, and then we crank this pod up to 88 miles per hour, and cast it off through the back lots of Tinseltown, into the Upside Down, through the Arroyo Seco and the Devil's Gate, up the Para Mountain, and finally on to the Throne of the Gods. I do want to tell you that what you're about to hear is actually the fourth time, yes, the fourth time that Matt and I attempted to record this conversation. The first two times the strangest thing happened. We got disconnected on Skype about ten minutes into each conversation. Now that's not strange, but what is strange is that both of those times when we got cut off, my computer, my entire computer, froze up. I had to reboot it. Very odd. Never had that happen. This is a new machine, too, which made it even weirder. And the third time we connected, we did it phone to phone, and uh, the quality was just, it was not good. So this is our fourth attempt at recording this conversation for you. It took us a couple of weeks to figure this out. Matt doesn't have uh, the best of luck when it comes to technology, he told me. He said, quite the paranormal life, as you will hear. And this was quite the paranormal occurrence, but fitting for this time of year. So let's roll the reel on this real-life Hollywood horror story that Matt DeMille likes to call Hollywood. Enjoy! <laughs> Matt DeMille, welcome to the show, my man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, no problem, man. Before we get going on your personal story and some of the things that you're knowledgeable of... I wanted to talk a bit about today, the day that we're talking on, not the day that this will air, but it's Saturday, September 23rd. We're the ominous date. The ominous date. Yes, I'm so glad that you're aware of this. So from your experience, and we'll flesh out your background in a minute, 
and people will, you know, do what they want with this information, obviously. But the whole internet's been a buzz for a while now about September 23rd, September 23rd, something big's happening, apocalyptic, world changing. If you're a Christian, apocalyptic person, you know, world ending type of stuff. But what is it particularly about this date? I don't think it's the first time this particular date's been thrown around on the internet in terms of big things or big changes happening. But have you been paying attention to any of this? I've been watching it, but I'm I'm not certain. Much. Well, I guess if everyone's hearing us, nothing did happen since we'll be playing this weeks after the, the date. But I don't. I, I I've heard the date come up before. The past September is the date. Twenty third has come up. I'm not sure where it comes from, where it started. I'm not sure if it's uh, got validity or not. But we're in so many other periods, the 40 days of tribulation and things like that, we still have about a week to go. So I, I'm not too concerned about today. I'm concerned about every day on both ends of it. And my perception, I have to admit, is slightly skewed because I have a, a date that haunts me, and that is the 27th, four days later. So I, this is a time when I just can't focus too much, as Yoda would say, the dark side clouds everything. We have everything going crazy today, uh, but when's it not going crazy? That's Holding true, breath. yeah. <laughs> I've talked to some other people recently about fall, autumn being that time of year where the veil gets really thin between this world and perhaps some other worlds. So I don't know what you make of that, but it does. <coughs> things do seem to get a, a bit more uh, witchy this time of year. As we go into Halloween, Hallowfest, Hall All's Hallowed Eve and all that, the ancients believed that Halloween was the, the night of the year when the veil was thinnest, so it thins through autumn. And the ancients knew so much more than we like to give them credit for. We're recrediting them now, but you know, we talked in the last uh, podcast about energies, you know, energy zones on the earth, and the veil does thin at this time. The ancients knew it. The ancients marked it with holidays and celebrated it. So... In my experience and research and everything else, we are dealing with interdimensional phenomena. So at this time, September, October, autumn, more ghosts, more UFOs, more, as Dr. Stance might say, uh, interdimensional cross rips going on. The worlds, uh, we get closer together. There are so many energies that we can't see. And I mean, even electricity was not visible or known to people until a few hundred years ago, but it was there. There are so many forms of energies in the earth, ley lines and things like that. We are, our bodies, our flesh, our, our matrix avatars are microcosms of this reality. We're in the planet. We have cycles. We have youth and we grow old. The seasons come and go. We, like the ancients, should learn more from nature it tells us the veil is thin, the leaves are falling, things are changing. We just have to be more attuned to more energies than we are just electricity and combustion and the basic city industrialized man type of energies. We need to be more in tune with the earth cycles, the celestial cycles, the the ancient ebb and flow and yeah, the, the veil thins. I'm not sure if I would put it to ether, but it happens. You know, I don't understand why it happens so much, but I just know that it does happen. Okay. It's an exciting time. I love yeah. autumn. It's my favorite time of year. Yeah, it's always been mine too, going back to my youth. I'm not sure why. I don't really nowadays do anything special for Halloween. I just sort of, it's just another day or it's another time for me. So I'm not sure why I like it so much. Maybe because I do feel that shift or change in the energy in the air or I guess in the atmosphere, you know, it, it does feel different. But you have that feel with every season. But for some reason, fall or autumn has always just sort of stuck out to me as the most noticeable change. Well, it's, I think it calls to the human uh, spirit of adventure. It's like at twilight, that's when the cats get on the prowl and they get their energy. During the summer, we labor. During the spring, we're refreshed. During winter, we're hun hunkered down. But autumn, is it's like, even at Christmas time, we have traditions. We have feel-goods. We have routines. Halloween as a child is always that time that you get to be creative and more fun. And as you grow older, I think the season still holds that magic in a different way. It changes subtly, but it's still the time of year when everyone gets to 
whether they're going to costume parties or it's just the general energy, they get to look beyond the horizon a little bit. You know, they get to indulge the that sense of adventure that I think is inherent in humans. And we're not meant to be stagnant. We're not meant to be unchanging. We're as part of this matrix and, uh, as I said, a microcosm of the earth. We are meant to be in constant change and growth. Halloween's that time when we get to have that adventure. I think it appeals to a lot of people, and I think most people interested in the esoteric, uh, in my experience, have found autumn. Not how some, uh, Halloween itself, but autumn in general. Something about that time of year. We're affected by it. Halloween is fun. The whole season's fun, but there, as we've talked before, I've personally had my I've had walk-ins. I've had things happen to me. So uh, it's not all fun and games. There are real dark forces out there. Yeah, and I think we may talk about some of them during the course of this conversation. But before we do, let's talk about you. Because if anybody has any sort of knowledge of Hollywood, Hollywood as you call it, or of sort of general film history, they will recognize your last name. We're talking about DeMille, Cecil B., to be exact. Uh, He's known as the founding father of American cinema. He co-founded the first Hollywood studio, Paramount Pictures. Uh, He directed damn near 80 films, most of which were silent films, and the most famous of those was The Ten Commandments, uh, made back in 1923. So, Matt, you appear to have some of this Hollywood blood in you. Could you outline that bloodline for us? Certainly. I have to say, when I was a child, I didn't like the name so much. It was easy for kids to make fun of, you know, and uh, the male always misspelled it. But I never had any intention to get into film either. I wanted to be a role play game designer. And eventually I ended up in Hollywood and I was glad I kept the name. And it's only then in my 30s that I did the, the research. And the bloodline split. Uh, back in the 19th century on the eastern seaboard. It's a, uh, they came over from Europe. From uh, It's a Dutch name. And one bloodline went north through Canada, and the other went west. So one bloodline ended up in the Vancouver, Seattle area, the other in Los Angeles, Hollywood area. And so I go back to about a great-grandfather to Cecil B. DeMille, but there is a blood, he is a blood relative. And it's interesting how much weight that name carries in Hollywood. When I was at the American Film Institute in 2008 to 10, it's a two-year program. I got asked about that name a lot, and I really wasn't, oddly, my only connection to it was I was interested in Indiana Jones was my thesis work. So I, you know, the Lost Ark had interest to me, but not, you know, Christianity or, or uh, religion or Judaism or uh, even masonry but it turned out that all these became very important parts of my story later on so synchronicity is a word I cannot over use in my story well have you done any genealogical research into your family connections here do you know for sure what type of relation you are to Cecil or are you just Uh, going by how you were treated I guess in Hollywood when you were there Well, it's a little bit of both. I really didn't have as much interest as others did. They, I had several people do their genealogy and they all had different results. So I'm sort of, I'm averaging it saying it was a great grandfather. I forget if it was a great, great grandfather or a great grandfather on the, you know, once removed or a, it was, it was something that went back to, I think it was 1870 or 1880 was when the split was. It was in that time. And the way people treated me was, well, I'll uh, skip ahead several chapters. The uh, you, you have a savvy audience. I had many opportunities to join the clubs, the, uh, the crowds that peddle pizza and such things. It was a name that opened doors. I just didn't realize its value at the time. kind of scared me off looking into it too much. The whole Hollywood is a scary place. It was begun by good people, Cecil B. DeMille, even Disney and others. But it's become corrupted and overrun with it's now a hive of scum and villainy. You did embark, though, on a career in film. You said that you spent a couple years at the AFI doing some sort of program, right? What were you there for, and what did you learn while you were there, I guess? Well, the AFI is a master's film program, and it's considered the Harvard or the Juilliard of Hollywood. 
you learn directly from professionals in the field, above the line people. The AFI gives you a golden ticket to pretty much everywhere in Hollywood. It's, it's like the Royal Film School. It's Hogwarts for Hollywood. And in my case, it, it doesn't train actors. It's all behind the, they train directors, screenwriters, editors, et cetera. In my case, production design, art department, building sets, special effects, props, all that, you know, all that, not costumes. Wardrobe is a separate thing, but if it's a film set or it's a prop, if it's a special effect, that was what we were trained for. And that gave a, gave me a third special pass where I had to tour the studios and look at all the sound stages because we had to know how big can we build a set on stage 32 or whatever. And then as a conspiracy person, literally wearing my Indiana Jones hat, I took well advantage of that and snooped around everywhere. Stories for another time. There's lots of them. At school, ironically, I would spend a lot, most of my time at a drafting table with a square and compass amongst other tools. And um, going back to Cecil B. DeMille for a moment, the Ten Commandments for those conspiracy-minded or occult-minded, the Temple of Solomon, the basis of Freemasonry. Indiana Jones did my thesis, ended up becoming a Mason. The two years I was in Hollywood, it's a pass-fail program. It's considered a conservatory, not a, you don't have like textbooks. You just make films, you learn, you get groomed. The grooming process takes place even at film school where they say who they can blackmail. You get invited to parties. It's a lot of socializing. It's a lot of mingling rather than going to class. And it's a small town. After I graduated, I started to work in the business, but I ran afoul of because I never would be corrupted. I wouldn't take the drugs. I wouldn't take the prostitute. I wouldn't take, I wouldn't put myself in a compromising position. I was too paranoid. Well, if you don't play ball, you don't last long in that business. So that's why I only was there for a year after film school, got out of town. When I left the business, I left LA, I left California, I came back up north to uh, the Puget Sound area, Tacoma, Seattle area. I wasn't quite sure what to do at the time. As we mentioned uh, before, it is Halloween time, an appropriate storytelling time, but dealing with dark forces scared me like I'd never been scared in my life and haunted me. I lost not just my fiance and my career and things. I lost interest in those things. It was uh, a time of coming back and like, what? it's not just what do I do with my life, it's what is the world? What's going on with the world? I didn't need a red pill moment, as they say now. Uh, I was already pretty conspiracy-minded, skeptical, didn't trust the government for anything. But I had a lot of catching up to do. I'd been out of the loop on conspiracy and uh, paranormal lore for a long time, being involved in movies. And I just spent a couple years sitting on my savings, not really doing anything, just learning, 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 you know, podcasts, uh, independent news, catching up on everything from Bilderberg to Bohemian Grove. And in my case, it was a matter of, oh, that's what. I was being, you know, not Bohemian Grove specifically, but I thought I was going crazy. But then I started to become aware that, oh, this is actually happening. I just can't, you know, got too close to it. All these conspiracy people talking about Hollywood, but they hadn't actually been there. I did. I had. So it was a matter of learning and coming to terms with what's going on in the world now. And after I got used to that, after a few years, I started to get my life back together and abandoned all former projects and just began new ones. Uh, I have books that I work on, a series of novels. Uh, there's a paranormal story there of channeling information in the past. Short version is I wrote them over 20 years ago, registered them so I can prove it. Going back and reading them now, how did I know what I knew? And as I mentioned, masonry, went through the degrees, did that. And I do uh, a YouTube where I share as much information as I can about everything I know. Uh, I do film commentaries, a daily wizard log, and testimonies of my paranormal experiences in detail by subject. So it's just time-consuming trying to fight the good fight. You're very prolific on YouTube, to be honest, and you 
do put out a lot of content. Uh, seems to be suppressed, to be honest. Doesn't get a lot of views. <laughs> no, <but>. <laughs> I I was heavily suppressed before. I about 2013 is when I really started getting hit hard. I originally had Jesse Ventura's conspiracy theory shows up there, and I cut them down so they cut out all the repetitious bookending for commercials. And I had over a million views on those alone. Oh, they got pulled down. And then I tried doing some different stuff I made, and then all that got, I must have been marked early. And ever since then, I've never been able to get my head back above water. I, I'll, I'll put out something. I have over a 1,000 subscribers. I'll put out something. It'll get two or three views, and then it'll get hit with a mon- demonetization. I'm like, it wasn't even monetized. They, they don't like me. Yeah, they don't like a lot of people these days, it seems. So you mentioned you joined the Masons. When did that happen, and how has that influenced you in terms of conspiracy because they seem to have a negative reputation as an organization so i'm just curious what being a part of the organization the fraternity i guess the brotherhood what has that taught you since you've joined it about conspiracy it's been a very interesting experience i had heard about the masons long ago in fact it was my brother who first mentioned way back in the early 80s i don't know how he knew we're estranged so i can't ask him but he said, you know, that Washington, D.C. was all laid out by Freemasons. And I was like, free, free what? Masons? Who? What? You know, I didn't know what that was. And then I took an interest in Jack the Ripper in the 90s. And I, I actually did go to London in 96 and visited the Ten Bells and took the Rumbelow Ripper tour. And, of course, Jack, uh, uh, Jack the Ripper has the Freemasonic connection, part of the legend. That comes up. And I heard, well, again, who are these Mason people? When I finally asked them, I said, so they were the founding fathers? And they said, yeah. And I said, so they're not bad, right? They said, yeah, okay, as long as they're on our side. you know. And I just sort of shrugged it off for years and years. When I came back from L.A. and I was catching up on all things conspiracy, and I was separating the wheat from the chaff, deciding which independent news sources were worth listening to and which were not. The Masons, of course, came into the mix. And I had a few Masonic friends at AFI. I did not know it at the time. Part of my thesis, I mentioned Indiana Jones, I exposed a lot of things you're not supposed to expose, methinks. One of many ways I made enemies down there. But when I started getting into conspiracy stuff and I started putting it on my Facebook, you know, I was one of those around 2012, hey, you want to look at 9-11 again? And of course, you lose all your friends for it. My Masonic friends contacted me and started saying, no, Masons aren't so bad, because I started to believe that I started to go down the wrong belief of Masons are all evil and they're all Illuminati and all that. And then I I realized I've been judged without being given a trial. I don't judge without a trial. So I, I just researched and researched the Masons. And the more I realized, it's like they are the founding fathers. There's a lot of good, famous Masons. I think there's a conspiracy mix up here. There's There's something wrong with the public perception. And I became more curious. And eventually, I just went and knocked on the door. I didn't think I'd be admitted because I was very upfront. You know, hey, I listened to InfoWars. Is that a problem? And no, it wasn't. Very non judgmental. Since I've been in there, I joke with them about everything from public per- misperceptions to Hollywood. And I, uh, the Masons are like any group of people. There's a variety of beliefs. I've heard Masons say that Oswald did it. I've heard Masons deny chemtrails. I've brought these subjects up with them. They're human beings with various beliefs and um, dogma and denial. It's, it's a club. It's generally not used for what it should be, nine out of ten Masons, in my experience, are just there because they like the fellowship. Or Very few of them are interested in the esoteric, which is a shame because that is, in my opinion, the heart and soul of Masonry. That's its most important element. And if you have the right mind for it going in, you know the old expression, you get out of it what you put into it, that sort of thing? Mm-hmm. Masonry, if you go in with more of an esoteric mind, you will get much more out of it than you will just as a... You can join any number of clubs. There's Rotary Clubs. There's Moose Clubs. You want to join the Masons if you want the esoteric, because that's, as I said, their heart and soul. And in my case, coming from the conspiracy, research, the paranormal, the Hollywood, applying all of that, it's a treasure trove. I love it. Is there a 
a dark Masonic influence in Hollywood? Yes. This is a very confusing point that I'm really even currently trying to, uh, I'm exploring it slowly and carefully with the Masons, as uh, one could understand. There is a deliberate mix-up, and Hollywood and the general globalist culture is to blame. Hollywood, we all know, is their propagandist arm, their their mind control for the masses. And I've been there, and I've been trained by these people. I, uh, I like to say I'm a defector Sith. I was trained by the Sith to mind control people, and I say, you know what, this isn't right. Now, the Masons will say, well, that's all just nonsense. It's, consp- it's, it's conspiracy theory nonsense. And no, there's actually... In Hollywood, the Masonic influence was run out. Cecil B. DeMille was a Mason. He was run out of Hollywood, had to go back and fight for his turf. All the Masonic temples have been converted into propaganda satanic temples. Jimmy Kimmel's show is in the original Masonic temple. Um, Disneyland's been broken. That was built by Masons, and now it's totally messed up from its ener- the way it was built for flow of energy. As far as the lay of the land, they've messed it up. It doesn't work anymore on an energy basis. The Illuminati, for lack of a better word, the bad guys, the, they corrupt everything they touch. Masonry, Hollywood, America, they've turned America into their empire for conquest. Hollywood, it went from a place of imagination and wonder to mind control. Masonry is one more thing they can use, and so they use its symbology, but they pervert it, and they they turn everything upside down. That's what evil does. So Masons, I'm trying to tell, look, there's a real problem, a corrupting force making your name worse and worse, and I'm in a unique position to understand that. But it's a hard sell because a lot of them are you know, sort of rooted in their ways. They're older, and they will have their dogma. But at the same time, the public doesn't know what to think. Because on the outside looking in, it all looks creepy. Even I thought Masons were creepy at first because I had met the real evil in Hollywood. And when I was researching everything, I didn't know when my Masonic friends are saying, hey, you shouldn't say bad about Masonry. I was in no real position to say otherwise because I saw real pedophilia and satanic worship in Hollywood. I saw it up close and personal. So I was very inclined to believe the Masonic connection. So I can't imagine what the public can think knowing nothing. You know, it all looks, it all blurs together for them. So one thing I hope to do going public about Masonry is to try and right now on this show, set that, make that distinction. Brother Masons out there in the world, just like with the constitution, just like with Hollywood and everything else, it's being corrupted by the, the Illuminati for lack of a better word. They rely on confusion. Yeah, yeah, they do, and deception and, and all these, these different tactics. I don't like the word Illuminati. I'm, I'm going to have to disagree with you there. That, that I feel like that has been perverted as well throughout the it last has. few centuries. It has. Yeah. What, what should we call it? For lack of a better word, I, I wish we had a better word than that. The big club, as George Carlin calls them. I just see the Illuminati as a, the same sort of group as the Freemasons. I think it was a group that was founded with good intentions. I mean, when you look at their mission statements, they're very positive on the surface, at least. And when you look at their their esoteric teachings, particularly Masonry, which, you know, connects back to things like Hermeticism and the Kabbalah and Gnosticism, which, you know, is all about individual enlightenment and spiritual growth. Yes, yes. Yeah, they, they did have a good point. Yeah, another thing that's been corrupted. Just for the sake of the name, because you know everyone in Hollywood is doing that Illuminati sign. That's what their their gimmick they're told to use. Right. Uh, yeah, but you're correct. It it was a good thing. One more corrupted. When you were in Hollywood, then did you see or come across any household names that people might know that were practicing some of these dark arts, for lack of a better term, or pedophilia or anything like that? Richard Donner. Um. Ah, uh, God, the name actually escapes me, but uh, the director of the first two X-Men films. Um, Brian Singer? Singer, yeah. We had class with him. That guy has a cold aura. I mean, you look into his, he is cold. He's, he's definitely in the creepy crowd. Actually, we had class with a lot of people, but that's one that you just got the vibe from. And then I don't want to say any more on that. Is that okay? <laughs> Some... Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but... It's totally no, that's cool okay. You Please do. But sometimes I just might wander into a place where I'm thinking, you know, I might not want to say that because that could have repercussions. 
could get someone hurt. And I just, no, I understand. I yeah, don't mean to sure. frustrate the audience, but there are a few things like that. Let's go back to your thesis that you wrote at AFI. You called it Indiana Jones and the Throne of the Gods, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yeah. Uh, put a pin in that. I just thought of one I can tell you. Um, okay, sure. Go ahead. Crowley. Nathan Crowley, production designer of The mm-hmm. Dark Knight. Everyone talks about the third film with the Sandy Hook map. Well, I had private conversations with the head of that art department that would have made that call. And you can look into the death of the prop man in uh, Newtown, not far from an infamous non-shooting. Okay, the same production designer for all three films of uh, the Batman saga claimed publicly to be the descendant of Alistair Crowley. And he basically confirmed Sandy Hook would happen four years before it did. So there's a creepy story for you. I'm sorry, not Sandy Hook, the Aurora shooting, the Aurora, James Holmes. I, I told people about that like a week before it was going to happen. And everyone, ah, you're crazy. Well, there was a Sandy Hook connection too, like you said, with the map on screen. And I forget which movie it was. Was it The Dark Knight or The Dark Knight Rises? Dark Knight Rises, the, the strike zone one on the map, the river and the road and all that matches the Sandy Hook in reality. But the other thing was the, um, the connection is the LIBOR scandal between the fathers of Lanza and Holmes. It's a big $43 trillion European insurance fraud. And they have connections to the mind control military programs in Colorado. So that's a whole other rabbit hole. Indiana Jones and the Throne of the Gods, we can talk about that. <laughs> It's an interesting conversation I had with the descendant of Crowley of all people at school. Oh wait, wait, off. wait, wait! So you've you've met Nathan Crowley then? Yeah, um, it was routine. This is one of the perks of AFI. Every week we would meet someone. They'd bring in someone from a class. We watched The Dark Knight. We screened it on campus, and then the production designer and cinematographer were there for a Q and A, so we students could learn the trade. Now, most of my fellow students were a bunch of spoiled rich kids that as soon as they got a chance, they'd go out for a two-hour smoke break. I would go up and talk to these people and learn everything I could. And you learn interesting things. Sometimes you don't realize what they are at the time. And I'm not saying Nathan Crowley is guilty of anything, but he dropped hints. It's sort of like, well, we're going to have to do changes with the third movie. And I'm like, well, this doesn't make any sense. And then I come back and I'm listening to Alex Jones and others talk about this and that. And I'm like, wait a minute. Two plus two plus two, just did that. He was talking about there's going to be a theater shooting. Probably, oh, damn, there it goes. So you're saying that that he was talking about having to edit the film, The Dark Knight Rises, for well, he for whatever of- reason, for whatever reason, right? And then later on, the Aurora shooting happens, and The Dark Knight Rises is then edited because of that, right? Because there was well, a scene not, in that movie that took place in like a similar sort of scene? Not not edited. Uh, certain elements of the production. The production designer comes on before most anyone else because you have to build the sets. You have to do conceptual sketches. It's very early work for the art department. Most everyone else, the cinematographer, the actors even, they come on months, months later. So he was talking about very early pre-production. Everyone was expecting uh, the third Batman film in three years, not four, like it turned out to be. And he said, there's going to be a delay of one year because there's influential people that want certain changes to the script and they don't make sense. And I'm like, well, what kind of changes? Oh, changing the name of Gotham City to, to, to Sandy Hook for some reason. I'm like, well, what the, you know, why? Got comic fans. I would go to Comic Con and I would, you know, I was a big geek and I'd say comic fans are going to hate him if they change anything canon about Batman. Why, why do that? And he's like, why indeed? <laughs> it was, it was an interesting conversation, but he tipped off. The, and maybe he didn't know. I have to give him the benefit of the doubt, but it's like a military operation where you're given compartmentalized data. The art department is told, we want these changes. Don't question it. Just do it. And you don't realize until years later what those meant. Hmm, that, but, that is an interesting component and connection to all of this. Yeah, but let's go back to your thesis then because we can maybe transition the conversation a little bit here and talk about your premise of this thesis. Like we said, it's called Indiana Jones and the Throne of the Gods. I was wondering if you could share with us the premise of your thesis and why you wrote it. And you mentioned that you had put some stuff in there that you maybe shouldn't have. And maybe you could pull some of those nuggets out for us and share those as well. Sure. 
when you get to AFI, one of the first things you do in orientation is you're supposed to hold up, as they take your picture, you're supposed to, you hold up a little sign and they say, write your favorite movie on it. And all the, you know, like I said, the, the rich kids are like, gone with the wind, Citizen Kane. And I'm like, looking at them like, you boring people. And I hold, I put Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, let's, let's have some fun here. Come on, it's movies. And I just said, you know what? That's going to be my thing. I got my Indiana Jones hat. I'm just going to make that my sort of Andy kaufman is character here in Hollywood. And I would wear the jacket and the hat around town. When I would go to Disneyland, people would think I was one of the cast members. They would ask me for directions and things because I look. And I just indulged it. And when it came time to do your thesis, as I mentioned, it's a conservatory, not a traditional college. You don't write a paper for a thesis. You have a very interesting project, and I made it more complex than it needed to be. You do a film, which is a group project, but because it's a group project, you probably don't get to best represent your creative work in a thesis. So they allow, you do an additional project called the academic thesis. And what it is in the case of the art department, production design, is you take a, a movie of your choice and you redesign two sets. You take two key sets from the film and you say, this is how I would have made it look different. And I submitted a list to my professors, my mentors, about various movies of different genres. And I said, why don't you pick for me so that you, what do you think would be best for my abilities, my talents? Where do you think I would fit best in the business? And I had historical things like Patton. I had horror movies on there. And I had Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade on there. The reason I chose Last Crusade was that I thought it was the only one of the four movies that could have had some improvement. I mean, how do you improve the art department of Temple of Doom? You can't. That that temple is Im- amazing looking. Raiders of the Lost Ark is a perfect film. Don't mess with it. Crystal Skulls script had problems, but it looked pretty cool. I mean, the temple at the end was pretty neat. But The Last Crusade is just kind of a cave with cobwebs. There ain't much there. You could jazz that up a bit. I didn't just do two sets, though. I added to it. I added a script for a fifth film, which became... Throne of the Gods, and a few other side projects. And what I was really doing, and I didn't realize it, was channeling things. Because when I changed the the two locations in Last Crusade, I was setting up a basis for my fifth film script, uh, sort of working the mythology together. I changed the Venice Grail Knight's tomb to Constantinople, and if you look at the Crusades, it actually fits the time frame. There would have been a, a tomb there of a Crusader. There was a 50-year window where they, the Crusaders took it over. And then, oddly, I changed the Grail Knights, the, the Holy Grail Shrine. I, I picked it almost at random, like you know, throwing darts at a map. I said, where could this be, some other location? And I, where I threw the dart, I put a pin in that, hold on a sec. I wanted it to be not a place made by the Templars or the Crusaders alone, but like an ancient place, an Atlantean temple that they found, say something from the end of Atlantis 12,000 years ago. I threw my dart, so to speak, and it landed in southeastern Turkey, right exactly where Gobleki Tepe is. And I'd already decided it's going to be an Atlantean thing. So that was just weird. And then when I redesigned the Grail Knights Temple, I included a bunch of occult symbolism that you're judged on your presentation. You make foam core models, big presentation boards and all this to sell your set, so to speak. You're judged by a panel of film professionals whose IMDBs are quite impressive. I can't say who they are, but I will say that one of them had foreknowledge of 9-11. Uh, he was going to be on one of those infamous planes and he was told to get off. So there are favors and protection even down to the art level in Hollywood. One of them was, uh, well, I think it's safe to say Bill, the Planet of the Apes, the original. So there were a few other people there that I showed things in that presentation that I've learned later or not I shouldn't have shown. What gold nuggets can I take out of that? There were some Mason, the, uh, Masonic things that I didn't know. I thought I was making them up. I really thought I was making them up. When I made Throne of the Gods, the theory was that originally Paramount wanted five Indiana Jones films. And I thought, well, they've made four. Now, this was circa 2008, and I thought, well, 
it's three years from until the 30th anniversary of Raiders. Let's do that chronologically so it makes for Harrison Ford's age. You know, I wrote a script. And the idea was Atlantis coming together. The, the beginning, it, does, it goes from the mountain, Paramount, dissolves into the Great Pyramid at Giza, pans down to the Sphinx. Indiana Jones is going for the chamber Edgar Casey talked about with the records of Atlantis beneath the left paw, 30 feet down, I think. And the, the beginning adventure is always a throwaway adventure for Indiana Jones. You know, sort of a James Bond beginning, they say. I had him, I invented these chambers beneath the Sphinx, which are now turning out to be there for real, uh, underneath the rump. And uh, he gets a half map to Atlantis, sort of like a Piri race map for a MacGuffin, to use a movie term. And uh, at the beginning of every Indiana Jones movie, he's always betrayed isn't he? You know, throw me the idol. Um, any last words, Dr. Jones? Uh, this time he's older and smarter. Amongst those, the henchmen, the Egyptian diggers that are going to betray him to the bad guys, Sala's there. And Sala gets the guns on them and they get away together and it becomes a, a road buddy movie. The idea being symbolic of unity, coming together, friendship. The broken world of Atlantis to come back together. Indiana Jones is then got his gets his usual exposition from the government or whoever to go after the latest artifact because who's going after it now can't do nazis i thought i was making up again this is i'll say this a lot i thought i was making things up that turned out to be what everyone's now talking about in the literature you don't like the word illuminati but i had that sort of the nazis were just a pawn of a you know a deeper occult organization illuminati kind of didn't know anything about him. The adventure went to Yanaguni, Japan, borrowing from Graham Hancock's work there. The Underworld, I think, was the book. The Sunken Monuments off Yanaguni. And then to Cuba, the Atlantean ruins uh, off of Cuba. And being in the 60s, it had a wonderful, you know, Castro had just taken power and Indiana Jones can do a little bit of Han Solo smuggling. And John Reese davies Salas could reprise his role as a, uh, or not reprise, but an homage to Rodriguez from Shogun. And from Cuba, they go south to Argentina. I didn't know anything about the Nazis in Argentina. Made it up, put them there so I could have an encounter like raiders where they come up alongside their ship. And, and then they finally get to New Schwabenland, which I also didn't know about. But I thought, well, let's go down to Antarctica and have this, what everyone talks about now, the Fertile Valley, the New Schwabenland, the Nazi Haven, and um, I put in my, what I call the Illuminated Pyramid. Every movie has it, Mount Sinai, the Third Eye, the Pineal Gland. And at the top of the mountain was the Throne of the Gods. And the reason the bad guys wanted this Atlantean throne relic was it was a Montauk chair, and I didn't ever heard of the Montauk Project but I pretty much got it correct, its purpose. So you can change reality, make it your way. You can see through time and you can manifest things. And that's why the bad guys wanted it. The same reasons that we wanted the Montauk chair. And then I learned a few years later about it and my past with it. It was an interesting, uh, interesting thesis project. Yeah, I'll say. Oh, and as a synchronicity, Kathleen Kennedy was my guest graduate. She spoke at my commencement and is one of my honorary graduates, current president of Lucasfilm, Kathleen Kennedy. Wow. Tried Good. to put the script in her hands, but it was not successful. Well, it sounds like a hell of a story. Uh, I don't know how much of that is fiction anymore, but it's, it's, it's a hell of a story either way. Well, it's interesting that so many things I thought I... One reason I believe a lot of stuff that's out there in the crazier conspiracy world is I didn't find it. I invented it, and then I later confirmed it. It's like I didn't, you know, people say, oh, there can't be Nazis in Argentina. Well, I thought of that when I thought of other things that people say. I couldn't have made all that up because it's happened my whole life, and a lot of it is not what I want. I feel more like a referee where I'm just sort of taking it as it comes, good and bad. I've actually had bad things manifest that, uh, as I'm writing my book, right, uh, as I meant, uh, re mentioned, rewriting my books uh, from 20 years ago, polishing them, keeping the characters' names and events intact, but it's getting so grim and it's paralleling the headlines. I don't want to keep writing, it's scaring me. But it's, I'm, I'm not getting only good things out of it. 
So it's not in, it's not conscious. It's not intentional. I'm not quite sure how it happens. It's just happened my whole life. When I wrote role playing games, I channeled things in them. Uh, mashed potatoes. This means something. It's important. That's just everything I've done my whole life. When I made movies, I channeled things into movies. Uh, that turned out later to be true. Those, those two towers and everything I've done, they've always been there. The Montauk chair. I've been building that my whole life. And actually probably more bad than good. Crazy well, things. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, but you're writing about crazy things. So maybe if you wrote about good things, <laughs> some good things would yeah. happen. I'm just kind of joshing there. I'm not really being serious about that. But I do want to transition the conversation now just a little bit. Talking about Indiana Jones and writing your script. Uh, you're obviously, you mentioned this earlier about your YouTube videos. You do a lot of film commentary and things like that. So I wanted to talk about some films here that are relevant to our conversation here. And I think the first one that we should discuss, if you don't mind, is Stranger Things, which you mentioned the Montauk chair, the Montauk project. Ah, oh, yes. Stranger Things. Yeah. Anybody who has dug into this story knows that it was based off the Montauk project. A lot of people have come forward about this project. It's come up on this podcast several times already. I don't really want to talk too much about the project in general, but I think that we should talk about Stranger Things, and then we should also talk about your experience in 1983 that ties into this as well. So let's start with the with the show itself, Stranger Things. Uh, it's coming back for season two here soon. What is it about this series from your occult Hollywood perspective that really stands out to you? From the Hollywood perspective, it is an unexpected hit. They don't understand why it's successful because they've lost touch with humanity. But that nostalgia definitely is one of its major attractions. But another thing about it is that it's a world that's simpler. There's always an appeal. You know, I've, I've steeped my most of my body of work in traditional fantasy, you know, Lord of the Rings type of fantasy. Because you like to get away from the nuclear war, you know, all the modern madness. Stranger Things, it's amazing how just one generation ago, the world was so much simpler. You know, we don't have a cell phone attached to our head. You know, kids were still kids and rode bikes. People are, you know, there's a strong appeal for that in today's society where we've really lost our humanity. Everyone's on their phone at the restaurant, you know. You don't have that in 1983. It's, 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 I dare say it's romantic. And... I think deep down people know these things are real. It, it has that appeal X-Files did when it first came out of, I want to believe people knew UFOs were going on, but they didn't have a voice. The Fox Mulder became their voice. I believe too. Stranger things, people know the world's getting stranger. It's, it's a comfortable place psychologically. And I think Hollywood recognizes its success. Are they going to pervert it with the stranger things too? I don't know. I don't know. Are they covering up the Montauk project with it? I don't think they were that involved at first. They, it was low on their radar. They didn't think it was going to be a hit. There wasn't that much need to cover much up. Do you see any truth in that? Like I mentioned when I brought it up, that you do have a personal experience that may be able to shed some light on this as well. Uh, a personal experience, a lot of synchronous uh, anecdotal evidence from school. You can talk about Dan Aykroyd and Ghostbusters in there. And also that nagging, um, because I've channeled it, I have to wonder if other, so much of Stranger Things I've already written about before. And so it's like, well, if I came up with it, then someone else came up with it. That's two. It's coming from a source. It must be real. In this case, the black thorns and vines, that's a running theme in my novels. Uh, I took it from Dragon's Lair, the old game, but I went rampant with that dark upside down world. As far as the, um, uh, I'm sorry, can you back up the question a little bit? I was curious, your impressions of the portrayal of other dimensions in Stranger yeah. Things based on your experience in Hollywood and then also your experience in 1983 that we haven't shared yet, but we will. It's going to all tie in here. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a complex, and I forgot to give a disclaimer at the beginning that so many places my story will go. People are going to roll their eyes and say he's making it up. I can document everything. That's the kicker. So going to talk about, I'm going to go far afield here, but it can be documented. The interdimensional is what I always said had happened to me. Back in the 90s when I started telling my accounts of what had happened, people said, oh, you're just 
you know, alien abductions, pop culture. And I said, no, I didn't go anywhere. It was more like a interdimensional. I went somewhere between dimensions, not a spaceship. I, and I preached that. I, I stressed that difference for decades. It was always dimensions with me. When I, I made a game company years ago and I called it new dimension games. It's not a plug. It's long out of business. It's just, it was always interdimensional. When I saw entities as a child and I saw them numerous times as a child, three years old, five years old, nine years old, I always said it was like the curtain was rolled back between the worlds, more like a fairy abduction or something than an alien abduction. And they just, I had more of a ability to detect them. I saw them and they didn't like to be seen. It was that sort of just, oh, sorry type of brief encounter before I lost consciousness. In 1983, I had a documented disappearance. And by documented, I mean the whole school and the police department were involved searching for me. So it was the spring of 1983. It was in University Place, Washington, a suburb of Tacoma, uh, Sunset Elementary School. I went there from second grade to sixth grade. And this would have been, I was in third grade at the time. I was never one to run with the crowd. I didn't go and play football and dodgeball and all those things with the kid. I would, you know, climb the jungle gym or roam around the trees at the end of the or at the edge of the schoolyard with one or two friends. It was like stranger things. I had my few friends. It was, you know, not the popular kid at school. So I'd have been nine years old at the time. I had what you would call now a missing 411 David Pilates or a, a, a Steph Young type of disappearance or a fairy abduction where I, I, I knew something was going to happen. Don't know how I knew. I had one friend who was with me. His name was Jeremy. And I said, just when the bell goes from uh, class, when they, you know, all the kids go back in, you go, I'm, I'm staying here. I'm not coming in. And he's like, why? And I'm like, I don't know. I just, I just know I'm not going to be coming back. I did. I was, I just didn't know. It was so bizarre. And he was not the, uh, he could have been a bully, but he was just kind of just a, he was Jeremy. He's like, well, okay, if you're not going to come back in, I'm going back. Didn't think anything, of it. no alarm, no sense of alarm. He, so I have this vision in my head, this memory in my head of, you know, it didn't literally happen, but it had the impression to me of happening. I like to remember it that way of everything going silent and still right before a fairy type of encounter. The woods go silent. That It had that feel to it. But I don't sure, I'm not sure if it literally happened. I watched all the kids going in, and then I don't remember anything else until hours later when the whole school was looking for me. And I reappeared about 100 yards away, and there's a little green belt in between the field and the an access road next to a swimming pool, for those interested in the water connection to these sorts of disappearances. And Stranger Things has a swimming pool. <laughs> It was right there, and it was in a place where I couldn't have been hidden. There was no shrubbery. There was no undergrowth. There was just big, tall trees whose branches began about 10 feet above the ground, and this place had been thoroughly searched. It was just, I was somewhere else. I was gone for a few hours, and then I rematerialized, and even though I was wearing a heavy coat, and it was a warm spring day because mo many people were wearing shorts and flip-flops, I had borderline hypothermia. I was cold and shivering and my mother thought I had, she was uh, at work and she was doing very much the um, Winona Ryder hysterics because she thought I'd been kidnapped, cut up into little pieces. I mean, it was a horrible day. But I came home at the end of the day. And I, to this day, I don't know quite what happened. But it was going into the Montauk research that I found some answers, correlations with other paranormal events in my family, including in 1983, same year, the third entity that I saw at age nine, I always called it Leonard the ghost because my brother had said he had seen a ghost years earlier and named it Leonard. And I always tried to be like, my, you know, like my brother, but this was a clearly physically different entity. He described something that I now call the Fresno ghost. Um, and the house he was, we were in at the time he saw it was owned by my family from Fresno, but I saw a different apparition and it was, to borrow from Ray Stance, you know, full, uh, floating full torso vapor apparition. Not quite. It was like a, a ethereal white. And here's the kicker. 
and I've said this to psychiatrists in the 90s, to my friends for decades, I've said all this, it had no face. Just like in Stranger Things. This entity had no face, and this entity was in the house. I'd seen entities outside the window before. This is the first time it was in the house. And aside of the discrepancy of no face, as far as describing the luminous white quality to it, I'd never found anything in movies or literature to compare until over two years ago when I first saw Christopher Garitano's Montauk Chronicles. That entity that he depicts in it. And I even emailed him back back then, over two years ago, and I said, uh, I didn't ask him directly. I'm sorry to name drop. I shouldn't have done that. But I asked him sort of evasive questions because I didn't want him to just give me the answer. I said, how did you come up with this cool alien entity thing in the room in your movie? Who, you know, who came up with this? And it's the closest thing to what I've been able to find. But of all places to find it, Montauk Chronicles, that's pretty good. You did contact me. I think it was after that episode that I, I did with Chris. You emailed me and reached out to me, and that's how we connected. Highly respect uh, his work. Both of you. I'm sorry. I just... Um, oh, no. I haven't done anything, so it's fine. No, but um, Well, it, it seemed like the place that I, I could tell. So, you know, it's it's the right, the right audience. People are going to be receptive to this information. I think we're all open-minded enough here to hear you out, for sure. So... Going back to fairy abductions, you know, that's something that fairies, I don't know if they're real or mythical, all right, let's just put that out there, but there's a lot of fairy lore that comes from the Celtic culture, from Irish culture. Montauk blood. How familiar are you with fairies in general, and are you saying that 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 was for sure what you were abducted by? Oh, no, no, I just meant like that, you know, not like a UFO coming down with a beam, it was more like... You just stepped into another world in the forest. It was more dimensional than galactic. Uh, is fairies it, is just, I think well, the same phenomena has happened throughout history and back in the Middle Ages, they called them fairies and we call them something else now, but it's interdimensional interference. Right. Is it like, did you ever watch True Blood when it was on? Mm-mm, sorry. There is a fairy element to it that you may be interested in and actually... It drives a lot with what we're talking about in terms of just walking through a forest and stepping onto the other side of that veil and just ending up in a different realm, so to speak. Well, even alien abductions, a lot of the times, go, uh, go into the same sort of metaphysics. It's part of our this world that we're in. We can call them what we want, apply whatever names we want to them, but it, the, these things happen. And I think it is possible to be recreated with technology and what all these projects are about. It's tampering with dimensional portals and energies. And we see the birds we want to fly. We build our airplanes. We see the others can do this interdimensional stuff. And we got our Nazi scientists to work on it. Did you watch The X-Files when it came back last year? I didn't watch all six episodes, was it? I watched bits and pieces. I definitely know the general plot and how they were exposing more or less what's going on I, mean, I was wondering because there is a a line in that that the um the alex jones type character is i think it's him that says it's just a conspiracy of men and i that line hit me when i heard it and it stuck with me for the past year and a half or however long it's been since that that particular episode was on but i wonder if a lot of this paranormal folklore isn't just bullshit to be honest that it that it is just human beings being terrible to other human beings. I think a lot of it is that. There are paranormal things, but evil people will take advantage of them, as we've discussed, and they will use them to their own ends. In my own experience, I think what happened to me was man-made, but it was inspired by more ancient and esoteric things. You know, the Montauk Project is clearly the work of evil men, but... Certainly, entities outside this reality exist as well. Yeah, but most of the, there's a lot of disinformation put out, certainly, and they like to keep us confused. It makes it easier for them. World's waking up now, game's changing. Don't know where quite it's going. I like the direction it's going, though. I like more people waking up. I mean, it's sort of a, uh, sort of a, a painful, uncomfortable, personal thing to go through, but, 
you come out on the other side of that, I think, you know, like we've been talking about, more aware, more conscious of, of not only what's going on around you, but more conscious of yourself and who you are and what it means to, to be a good person, what it means to to love and be compassionate towards your fellow man and, and animals and uh, spirits too, right? Yeah. Uh, can I preach from the pulpit of Dr. Jones for a moment? Please do. It's a lesson of Indiana Jones. First movie, doesn't get the art. He never gets the treasure. He got the girl. Second movie, rescued the children. Third movie, he didn't get the grail. He got, as Brother Connery told him, illumination, Junior. Fourth movie, he even, Jones himself says it, the true treasure is not gold, it's knowledge. And he says this standing on top of a mountain. And in the fifth film, just when I mentioned Sala, I was going to have everyone come together, and it was all about they didn't betray him. He was the friends. And they, at the end, he could have had the chair, but he left it. He said, you know what the real treasure is? Each other. You know, and they just walk off into the sunset together. Everyone concerned with the external, it's the golden calf. The real treasure is the experience inside. It's always internal. Couldn't agree with that more, man. So let's talk more about some films then. One of my favorite films of all time, going back to my youth, has always been Ghostbusters. I was and... hoping you'd ask that next. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I usually try to watch it in October at some point, just, just because, you know, I, I'm in the mood for it. It's such a great film, at least to me. You know, it's very nostalgic. But you have a very interesting take or interpretation on the symbology, the, the occult symbolism in Ghostbusters, particularly as it relates to the Scarlet Woman, which is an idea that I believe Aleister Crowley put forward. Uh, and many others have too. I think he's the most notable one. You mentioned Dan Aykroyd several minutes ago. What can you tell us about the screenwriting and production process of Ghostbusters, what went into that, and then what the movie ultimately symbolizes? Well, I can tell a lot on that one. Uh, Ghostbusters, one of my favorite films as well. Loved it, loved it. Scared the hell out of me as a kid, but uh, it was worth it. And if you look closely at Gozer's Temple, you have an illuminated pyramid between two towers and the crystalline gate and the Scarlet Woman. Now, it's a funny thing about those pillars. That's one of those things I channeled my whole life. And in fact, when I did a, an independent feature film years ago, uh, back in 2005, I had the job of decorating a church. It was not in the script, but the goddess has to materialize. But how does she materialize? Well, I decided to get out my chainsaw and carve up some foam and make two towers to materialize between in a gozer sort of way. Now, the Scarlet Woman, speaking of Crowley, Yes, the Scarlet Woman and all his sex magic, moon child, and all those things. She is a favorite of Hollywood that shows up a lot, I'm sure your audience knows and guests have talking about, but Dana Barrett is definitely one of them. And she ba they're basically doing a Crowley ritual. And if you think about when Egon is telling everyone in the jail about you know bizarre rituals up on the roof and Tobin's spirit guide, you just have to substitute Evo Shandor for Aleister Crowley in New York for Pasadena. And you get into the JPL, Crowley, Parsons, Hubbard, Babylon working. I have a long story there too. Been there, had stranger things happen there too. But getting back to Ghostbusters, Dan Aykroyd wrote Ghostbusters at Martha's Vineyard, which is a stone's throw from Montauk, in 1983. During the summer, when the whole Montauk Jr. Uh, shutdown was happening, the Stranger Things for Real was happening. And if you think about the Ghostbusters talking, remember, Dan Aykroyd conceived everything. That was his baby. And he's a, a lifetime history in the paranormal, four uh, generations of seance masters. When I met him, I had him autograph his family's book. because it was uh, I know it was important to him. He got the physics right. Crossing the streams is basically talking about the particle accelerator, CERN. It all comes from the, Mon, you know, the Montauk technology is, is all related. It's opening stargates. Dan Aykroyd writing at the same time Montauk is happening right next door. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. He was telling us how it was done. And he was definitely in the big circles. He was dating Princess Leia back in the day and 
Uh, he was, he's even in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. He got Indy on the plane. Art Weber. Yeah, he's yeah, also, he not to deviate too far, but he's also a, a big UFO guy these days. Oh, yes, yes. Unplugged on UFOs, that DVD is, uh, I made several people watch it, including some of his old employees, some of uh, his other production designers were my mentors, and I said, did you know this about Dan? Watch his UFO stuff. And, yeah, Dan Aykroyd, untapped genius. I wish they would use him, I wish he had... Uh, some big movies coming out telling us all about the UFOs and things. That'd be great. Yeah, it definitely would be. Uh, he, I've always been a big fan of him uh, as an actor and comedian as well. So I think it's one of the reasons. I mean, obviously Bill Murray too. I think it's one of the reasons why I just like Ghostbusters so much. So going back to Ghostbusters then, just the, the meat of the film, that does have a, a parallel like you were talking about in terms of other dimensions. You know, they summon this this traveler. Yeah, it's not even really about ghosts. At the end, it's about interdimensional stuff. And I thought that was weird as a kid. You get ghosts in the first half of Ghostbusters, but then it gets into something else. What's going on? And Dan Aykroyd even wanted to do an interdimensional plot for the third film. Did you ever hear about the third film with Hades? Uh, yeah, I do remember hearing something about it many, many years ago, but you'll have to refresh my memory. Uh, he said if you, the concept was, you remember those old, like, um, and you get a, a Cracker Jack box or a cereal box, a little red strip, and it, it or, or, or no, what do you call them? those movie posters? You look at them one way, you look at them slightly different. They change the image. It's just two images that f switch back and forth. Oh yeah, yeah. He said, picture New York, but if you look at it slightly different, change the frequency, it's hell, and like the Hudson River is boiling lava, and Hades rules Manhattan, and it's another dimension. Hell is just one frequency step away that's what he wanted to do and in fact when i talked to him i asked him if he would come to afi and speak he said and i quote it would be an honor and then we ran afoul of the same communist purge they didn't want him to speak and we all know how sony and pascal and all those shut down ghostbusters and ugh, they didn't want reitman involved they didn't want any of the original people involved but he was willing to come to school and talk about how to do it but they didn't want any part of it imagine that but he was all about interdimensional stuff. That was what he wanted to do. Do you think that he was privy to something based on his... I mean, he's pretty high up there in Hollywood for many years. Yeah, I think Dan Aykroyd is... He's not, like, in the big club, but he's smart enough to figure out what he doesn't know. I, I think he knows it. That's probably one reason he stayed quiet. He just re went into quiet retirement, smart guy. He, he knows it's a monster he can't beat. So why get himself beat up? But he'll, uh, I think he knows he's pretty savvy to most things going on. Yeah, I would agree too. Just to go public, a person of that sort of stature in the entertainment industry to go public with their interests in a subject like UFOs, which to be honest, you think 2017, it's pretty obvious UFOs are real and you know, the nature of them obviously is, is still unknown, but it seems like he's been sort of cast off still just because of, of that, but um, could be misinterpreting the whole thing. I th yeah, well, no, I think you're right that um, he is sort of cast off. That happens. I mean, he was probably separated way early back in the 90s when he's always been outspoken. And back then you're a crazy UFO guy. And probably that stigma stuck uh, unfairly. But nowadays, if you look at Hollywood, boy, they'll get rid of anyone that doesn't agree with them. So Dan Aykroyd, just one of many. For many different reasons now. You don't even have to believe in UFOs to be ostracized. He just got ostracized early. Hell, he would. He, maybe he wouldn't take the blackmail at a certain point. You, there's a glass ceiling if you're not corruptible. Maybe he reached it. And then they don't want anything to do with you because you're not of immediate value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see that. You know, your star kind of burns out. Whether it's planned to burn out or not, I think is the question. But yeah, it... I mean, at some point, you probably are just useless to the agenda, so to speak, right? Yeah, they don't want anyone they can't control. Absolutely. They have to have you under control at a certain level. And Dan Aykroyd had no, no skeletons in his closet. He, he loves his booze and his UFOs openly. Can't really, you know, there's no secret. He's got a love, you know, a solid marriage. He's got uh, sound principles, his sound mind. He lives a healthy life. Well, they can't do much with that. Hollywood can't um, <laughs> make him say things that he might go into business for himself. You know, and then they'll have to kill him. They don't want to have to do that. Michael Jackson, uh, 
Charlie Sheen, anyone that opens their mouth. Randy Quaid. Um, yeah, Randy's making some some social media headlines right now uh, as we're oh, talking. Is he? Actually, oh yeah, yeah. You you should hop on the old Twitter, man. It's it's pretty lively. I haven't heard anything about Randy in months. We'll save that for another time, perhaps, because yeah, uh, I still yeah. have I still have some stuff I want to get to that you're more directly knowledgeable of. You mentioned Pasadena, some knowledge mm-hmm. of the supposed Babylon working that took place there. This is the the famous Jack Parsons story. JPL, mm-hmm. Jet Propulsion Laboratory. What knowledge do you have of, of that event or of Pasadena in general? Because that's a very interesting place. I have a great aunt who lives there. I've been there once. It really was a weird feeling being in, being really just in LA in general. Like every time I've been there, I've had just gotten this weird sort of energetic feeling about it. Um, not necessarily negative, just different. But Pasad- yeah, but Pasadena specifically, the one time I was there, I remember feeling overwhelmed. What's your knowledge of Pasadena? What's your knowledge of the Babylon working? How does it tie into what we're talking about here? L.A., the whole area is strong energy from the coast, good vibrations, inland to Pasadena. I used to go through Pasadena all the time. I'd go out to the Ren Fair, uh, various things. In fact, when I met Dan Aykroyd, it was in Pasadena. Get a crystal head vodka signing. The Babylon working again. This I was. I thought I knew stuff back when I knew. You know, I study UFOs. I know about Area Fifty One. I didn't know about so much. Had no knowledge of Parsons, Hubbard, Crowley, Babylon, JPL. None of that. No knowledge whatsoever. My fiance liked to go hiking. I did not because I like Indiana Jones. Have a phobia of snakes. When you walk around, you go hiking in the Griffith Park trails or around L.A. and you see rattlesnake sign warning, it gives you a little, uh, you know, can, we have a gym membership. How about, we go to, or how about we go to Venice Beach? You know, it's a nice place. I let her pick the places. And one day in the spring of 2011, when everything was going bad, lots of, lots of drama, don't need to go into it now, but every, it was a Griswold Hollywood. Everything was going bad. And thus my shields were down. I was susceptible to influence already living in a haunted apartment ley lines going right through it entities everyone says it had bad vibes that apartment but she takes me hiking i'm not blaming her she doesn't know this is just what happened to ground zero for babylon working out to that arroyo Sakaro watershed runoff north of the rose bowl devil's gate and we parked next to the baseball diamond and we walked, it's maybe a half mile, maybe a quarter mile, it's not very far, to the watershed runoff. And I just had this overwhelming feeling of, I've, I've lived most of my uh, adult life with anxiety attacks, panic attacks. And I went through the pills years ago that I, I think SSRIs should be outlawed. I use cannabis to medicate and it's much more effective. But I know what panic attacks are. This was no pain. At the time, I thought that's what it may have been because I had no other comparison. It was a it was a negative influence of some sort of a walk in a possession, I dare say. And it's been a problem for years since it's done a lot of damage to my life. But I just felt a rush of like cold nausea, like what came over me? It was. And I just told Jessica I said, I I just got to go. I got to go home. She thought I was like, oh, you just don't want to be around, you know, out here around the snakes. I'm like, no, no, something's wrong. Something's really wrong. And then for a month after that, when I would lose my temper, which would happen often because everything was going bad and I was not, I was in a worse condition now. I kept threatening to jump off the roof of our apartment building and, you know, commit suicide. I didn't know about Suicide Bridge just south of Devil's Gate. Look it up. It's where the, we drove past it all the time. You see it filmed all the time. It's the bridge where they have like a railing, about 10 feet tall, a fence around it, and all these little gothic-looking lamps. The railing is there to keep people from jumping to their deaths because since the bridge was built in 1913, they've had over 200 people jump to their death from that bridge. And this is, to give you the geography... JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Jack Parsons Laboratory. Literally, its front yard is the watershed runoff where 
they had their Babylon ritual working. And as best as I can tell from Google Earth, where they summoned Lom, the gray alien, was exactly where I was standing when I had that feeling. Just south of that is the Rose Bowl. And just south of that is Suicide Bridge. And just south of that is the exterior where they filmed Doc Brown's house from Back to the Future. Werner Doc Von Braun of the Montauk Project and Disney, amongst others. I could tell you all about Back to the Future, too. Well, but please do. Old. I mean, if it, hey, if it comes up, let's talk about it. What's up well, with Back to uh, the Future? Uh, well, I'll put, I'll put a pin in that, but... There's a lot of things hidden in that, and one of my thesis mentors was Neil Canton, producer directly under Robert Zemeckis, so I had lots of private talks with him. So when you talk about the occultism and the time travel, pineal gland transcendence in Back to the Future, it's real. Uh, but finishing up on the JPL, there's more. One of my own, there are several people I've met in my life that have a scarlet woman vibration. I had a friend at the time who had friends at JPL, and she was a Scarlet Woman vibration. Hey, wait, could you define what you're talking about exactly? Scarlet Woman vibration? What do you mean by that? There are four people I've met in my life who have, it's like in the movie Highlander, when another immortal's around, you just get a sense that there, there's one of them. There's four women I've met in my life that just have this weird feeling and uh, I never end up in relationships with them. It's always just a weird friend. And one of them, for example, when we first met, she insisted that I should read Stranger in a Strange Land. And her friend Orion wanted us to hook up. You read the Montauk books. It says, a woman will come along and want you to read Stranger in a Strange Land and they will have this friend named Orion. Can't make it up. In another case, oh no, okay, um, this was a different Scarlet. I refer to her as Scarlet number two, sequential order of when I've met them. Scarlet number three was the one with friends at JPL. Weird things happen. Back to the future. Um, people may have heard about the 9 11 symbology hidden in Back to the Future and the Greek gods overcoming death. There's so much hidden in those movies. How long do you want to spend on it? Oh, I mean, we got another 45 minutes, so. Okay, uh, back to the future now then? Okay. That's fine. Uh, time is not linear. People are starting to awaken to this. that time, We're not even in a physical universe. We're in a matrix. And time travel is almost redundant. It, it, back to the future is going to be looked on as a, like a, a primitive thing. All time travel movies be like, oh, just linear, crude time travel. It's more about changing the matrix, just literally changing the program. So it's not so much about physical travel as it is about higher consciousness, back to the future, that is, your pineal gland. All, every movie in Hollywood ultimately goes back to that. 2001 A Space Odyssey, Ten Commandments, Star Wars even, the Death Star Trench. It's another, you know, focusing moment. And the geometry matches, if you look at it. It's the Kubrick Obelisk from the base is the Death Star Trench. It is Mount Sinai. It is the Philadelphia Art Museum for Rocky. It's all the same. It's the pyramid you ascend. And it's also the Hill Valley Clock Tower. And the clock is your pineal gland. The um, original script, Spaceman from Pluto, the time machine was not a DeLorean. It was basically a refrigerator. And you have to go back in time with a nuclear explosion, so Doc Brown takes Marty out to Trinity. This is why that whole sequence of Doomtown is in Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Because that was originally the ending of Back to the Future, the nuke the fridge scene. That was Marty McFly's time travel. Crystal Skull is about ascension as well. That's why the only thing Indiana Jones does at the end is put a crystal skull up to the pineal of the door and open the doors of perception. Uh, one of my mentors, Lauren Palazzi, was the art director on Crystal Skull, and she designed the Area 51 set, and she designed the Doomtown set. Now, she also did Independence Day, so she's built Area 51 more than once. I had lots of talks with her. Back to the Future is 9-11 foreshadowing, and it is also the Greek pantheon of Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades overcoming death, or Kronos. Zeus is Doc Brown, lightning. Marty McFly is Pluto, spaceman from Pluto, uh, and he has his invisible Hades hat in the second film. And Poseidon is the enchantment under the sea dance. His statue is there. 
Kronos is death and time. They overcome death and time and transcend it. That's what's really going on at the end of that movie. And it's Werner Doc Von Braun, who Montauk Project and other things. Doc Brown even says in the third film, they changed their name from the Von Brauns back after the First World War, I think is what he says. Mm -hmm. Tell people who haven't heard the 9-11 symbology what that actually is. I was just about to get to that. Yeah, 9-11 is foreshadowed throughout the movie, basically telling us it's going to happen in so many ways. First of all, you have terrorists show up at the Twin Pines Mall. Terrorists, kind of out of place in that movie otherwise, about the 50s and time travel. What are terrorists doing in this movie? The Twin Pines Mall becomes the Lone Pines Mall. You have your two and then third, your pyramid stack, but you also have the merging of dimensions. It's when Marty shows up at the, remember, he uh, show up at 1.15 a.m., Twin Pines Mall, remember Marty? He shows up at 1.16 a.m. In the terminology of Stranger Things, let's look at that upside down. What is 1.16 upside down? 9-11. And then terrorists attack out of nowhere, and then everything changes because two will become one, just like Twin Pines Mall becomes Lone Pines Mall, just like two towers in New York become one Freedom Tower after the terrorist incident that Marty tries to warn Doc Brown about at the end. He sends him a letter. You'll be shot by terrorists. I have to tell you about the future. Zemeckis was telling us about the future. And in the second film... When they're in the McFly's house in the future, and you have upside down George McFly, older George McFly, um, out of the movie, out of a contract dispute, which is why you never see his face, but he's hanging upside down. And he's looking at the wall, the TV screen that won't work. Remember, this thing never works. Well, what are they watching? They're watching New York, the Twin Towers, and it's going, it's the horizontal, I mean, the vertical hold is broken. So if you look at it from the perspective of George McFly, you're watching the Twin Towers fall straight down like a controlled demolition. Neil Canton was my thesis mentor, and I'm telling you it's not conspiracy hokum. These things are put in movies deliberately. 88 miles per hour is your DNA. It's all in your blood. It's all internal. That's why the Montauk boys are all about the blood and that Nordic race we were talking about earlier. It's all about unlocking the code. Mm, once yeah, you achieve nice. 88 miles an hour, essentially, once your blood, you have the right frequency, you can transcend. You don't need a car. The original film didn't have a car. That wasn't in the concept. But wasn't the the big clock set to 9-11 at some point? I think it was. I, I don't want to say for certain. There's so many details to remember, but you may be, you may be right on that. Interesting film that Zemeckis made not too long ago about the tightrope walker between the two towers oh yeah was that zemeckis really yes and you look at how he's dressed exactly like marty mcfly in his black in his red shirt and everything else and you look at the release dates you 30 years 30 years marty i have to tell you about the future and the two towers damn that's eerie that was a vortex day everything about these films throughout the years just like the art department doesn't know what they're doing that it's compartmentalized the larger movies and franchises build a consciousness. They develop an energy. We're talking about energy. Ley lines. I'm sorry, we got away from that. I, I can go back to that right now. It makes Stargates possible. 9-11 was an opening. And every so many rituals have helped it and it helps it maintain. Um, ley lines, we're talking about energy throughout L.A. That's one reason the whole city was chosen to be where it was. At film school, I had people say, oh, they chose it here to get away from New York. And it had to do with money and budget and blah, blah, blah. But it had more to do with the energy coming down off the Hollywood Hills and the, the ocean. And it was just it's Pasadena. You were talking about it being a creepy place, uh, an energy place. I took it as a creepy place, but. It's weird. It is weird, as you were saying. It's, uh, we don't yeah. have in our society, like I was talking about electricity earlier, people in the Middle Ages didn't have a way to measure it and regulate it, but it was still existent. It still was there. There's paranormal energies, and they're thick around Pasadena and L.A. People can sense them, but because we don't have a meter to put on it, we don't have Egon there with his PKE meter, what is it? It's weird feeling. But that energy is often harnessed and used in negative ways by Hollywood's magic, by JPL, by lots of things, lots of entities. 
how familiar are you with the layout of Los Angeles in terms of these ley lines? It's something I've heard a couple other people talk about recently in terms of they talked about Disneyland being laid out in a very specific way at first because of these ley lines. They talk about the placement of carousel or, or of the carousel in there being moved around. Mm-hmm. They broke it. That's what I was saying earlier when they broke right. it. I don't know about ley lines around all of L.A., but I can speak of ones I've experienced. Uh, They shot through our apartment, and our apartment was on the southern side of the Griffith Hills, right underneath the observatory, which was built by Mason. And Disneyland was going to be on the northern side of those hills in Burbank. And then they hired a Masonic architect to design it and he said let's move it one degree south to the 33rd parallel and disney was wise enough to go along with it when they originally built it disneyland was a well of energy a harmonious well this is an example of how masons and original hollywood did things for good reasons good purposes they wanted to build good things for america but people have since broken it The berm that surrounds the park, or used to, with the train tracks on it, that was sort of like the rim of the pool, rim of the well. It kept the energy in. And the carousel was like a, uh, meant to be the center to keep it sort of like churning, keep the energy flowing like a fan or a, uh... but when they redesigned Fantasyland in 1982, They moved the carousel like, I don't know, 10 or 20 feet or something, just enough to make it off center for some architectural aesthetic need rather than an esoteric and energetical need because you don't have smart people in charge anymore. And then they did other things to make it worse. They broke a hole in the berm for an entrance to Toontown, and now they've totally destroyed the berm, the whole northwestern quadrant of the park has been ripped out to build Star Wars land. The train will never go around the park again. The energy is gone. When people go to Disneyland now and say, you know, older people, people in their 50s or 60s, and say, when I came here back in the day, there was a whole different feeling. They go there now and it's just corporatism. The energy is gone. It's leaked out. It's gone. It can't regenerate. That's what does the evil do everywhere. Whether masonry, the Constitution, the Illuminati, they corrupt everything they touch. Are you familiar with Mount Shasta? Yes. It's right up here next to me. That's a curious area to me. What do you make of that? The energy is rich up here. We've got all the mountains. I I live in the shadow of Mount Rainier, and I've long felt the energy coming from that. Shasta I had never really thought much of, because I got mountains closer. But when I was coming back from L.A. and I had left evil behind and barely survived, and I was crawling back north licking my wounds interesting thing happened uh it was a two-day drive hauling my stuff north at the beginning of the second day i stopped you know stopped at a motel for a few hours the morning and i was just about to hit the california border oregon california border there was like the sky opened up it was like this not a portal literally but like just a sign from the heavens that you're entering into a better world. And it was just a good energy. And I thought this is a, the force is strong with this area. Or something. We were going right past Mount Shasta. So I just, there's a high, this is a high energy area. I don't know why later I learned about Mount Shasta and I've had an open challenge for years that I've wanted to get the right group of people I can trust to go there. But uh, I haven't been there yet, and I've actually never physically been to Mount Shasta because I uh, couldn't get the group up. Uh, my friends thought I was crazy. I think they were afraid to run into a UFO, personally. Hmm. If I ever get out there, well, let's do it. <laughs> well, I might go to one of these conferences or something. I don't know. It's uh, just a question of the right time. But the, the Mount Shasta itself, yeah. if you're ever up here, let me know. I think that You hear this talk of uh, ancient Lumerian cities beneath it and the UFOs seen coming and going through the top. And why not? In the words of Van Helsing, why not? The world is stranger than we know. I have no problem believing UFOs come and go all all over the place. I mean, there's that alleged gateway off of uh, Malibu, speaking of energies in Los Angeles. 
all the Cascade Mountains have such an energy here, and Shasta seems to be the strongest. So if there's a, a, a vortex zone or something, that would be my guess. Well, I brought up Mount Shasta because, well, one, it does connect to this whole ley line energy grid conversation that we've been sort of having throughout this. But I brought it up because one of the last times that we spoke, that we tried to record here, you told me some some interesting symbology behind the mountain as it relates to Paramount. Oh, oh, not Mount Shasta, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, okay. So I got but my mountains Mount, confused. Actually, Mount Shasta would work just as well. We can add that to the list of mountains. Yeah, um, it was Mount Sinai I was talking about. I'm sorry if that changes the question. No, it does not change the question. I would like you, if you don't mind, to tell the listener the connection between these mountains, Paramount Studios, and Steven Spielberg. Oh, yes, yes. Well, as I mentioned before, it's most of the big movies all tell the same story. Find your pineal gland. It's a journey up the mountain. It's li- literally represented in the Ten Commandments, the story of Exodus with Mount Sinai. Interesting thing, Sinai means reflection. And I always questioned whether an old man could carry two granite tablets. Or was it a UFO? Or you know, There's all these theories about what really happened with Mount Sinai. I think it is, like everything else, reflection within. You know, you're going up a mountain. It's symbolic. The mountain is the the mount the glowing capstone is your pineal gland. Base is your your limited sight. Two of three, I call it. Most people only have two eyes open, but their third eye is wide shut. And they don't ascend the mountain. They're content with the golden calf, the distractions of the matrix, their cell phones, their Xbox, their sports figures, their celebrity. That's their world. That's their consciousness. But Anyone who wants to can ascend that mountain, and the movies all show us. Spielberg most prominently shows us with every Indiana Jones movie beginning with that mountain. And Spielberg's name means play mountain. Spielberg. And what he's doing is he's challenging you to say this is more than a two-dimensional movie. It's a, a, an invitation to initiation, to ascend to something, to see more than it's on the movie screen to enhance your perceptions right there from the start. Uh, And so many movies, more than you would realize, follow this same archetype. They use the mountain. Everyone ascends a mountain. Close Encounters, Devil's Tower, the UFO shows up at the top. It's a flat top. It's that pyramid on the back of your dollar bill. It is the uh, Rocky ascending the art museum steps. Uh, It's even Leonardo DiCaprio, I'm the king of the world on the bow of the Titanic. It is all the pineal gland. Do you think Spielberg's uh, name is actually Spielberg? That seems like too convenient. Or if it was like a, you know, he, he changed. I, I've never heard of him having it changed. It might. I, I Demille is legally mine. I never changed it. It just worked. Maybe. Right, Spielberg but I mean, just, the way that you outlined what Spielberg meant, you know, play Mountain Spielberg, and then what he symbolizes in his films, what Hollywood symbolizes, you know, as an institution. It just, man, like probably the most recognizable film director in the modern era, Spielberg has this name that alludes to what we're talking about, this this esoteric journey of the self. And it sort of contradicts a lot of things, though, in terms of Hollywood propaganda. Like, it's usually negative and whatnot. But the journey up the mountain is actually, to me, it's a, it's a positive thing. You know, you're journeying towards your own individual enlightenment. It's an interesting correlation that I thought, Maybe it's just more like a stage name, you know? It's not his real name. Never heard it, but just throwing it out there. It could be. There's a lot of odd things about Spielberg that make you wonder if he was a manufactured person or if he manufactured himself. Maybe the men in black have it right, and he's like an alien under observation. But There's a story that he would haunt the film studios, that he would break away from the tour groups and then try and just volunteer his work, you know, like a little kid. And when Hollywood tells stories like that, you got to wonder, do they believe that or is that a line? Are they just telling us a story, feeding us a, a story? Spielberg has very mysterious beginnings, and he seems to be almost hand-picked to deliver along with George Lucas, the Altamont Speedway. He was the cameraman for the stabbing right after Sympathy with the Devil. So was Lucas just lucky, or was he... I I wonder if 
Spielberg and Lucas know everything or if they are themselves puppeteered by people higher up, their careers guided. I don't know. If, I, I, Spielberg, I, I wonder kind of what he is. And I've never thought about the name being like a stage name, but that's interesting. I, I look into that. Well, <laughs> yeah, so we got about a half hour left, and I want to get to Baron Trump. But before we do, I, I do need well, – I don't need to, but I want to share just a, a bit of a personal thing. I do have a, a weird well, – not weird. I do have a a loose connection to Spielberg through my family. I mentioned my great aunt earlier who lives in Pasadena. She's lived in Pasadena for years. Her husband, who has uh, since passed away – owned a woodworking company in that area. And one of the projects that they would do, I believe if it wasn't every year, it was like every other year or every couple of years or so, but they would build a custom desk for Spielberg himself, for his office. And my great aunt's husband was an Italian man, immigrant, who had a lot of missing fingers. And anybody who knows my family knows this. So I'm not I'm not making this shit up. We can verify this. Uh, it's not a big deal to me. It was just something that I grew up around, and I, we always asked him, "What happened to your fingers?" And he would blame it on being a uh, in World War II, which he was a World War II veteran from his own stories. But you know, having that Italian name and heritage, and being uh, an immigrant from there, having a successful they're very wealthy people, having a successful business in the Pasadena area where you're making desks for guys like Spielberg. As you're doing well for yourself. Pasadena's not cheap. Right, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and not to make this about me, it's not about me. It's just I thought it's an interesting correlation to what we're talking about. And the Pasadena mentioned earlier jogged my memory of that and Spielberg and all that. So it's it's pretty interesting connection, at least in my mind. But I did mention that we're, we're running short on time here. We got about... 25 minutes left uh, before I have to get going. So my apologies in advance to people that I'm going to have to be the one that cuts this short. But it's a good thing to wrap up on here. We'll go from the top of the mountain to underground with Baron Trump. Yeah, with Baron Trump's marvelous underground journey. This has been sort of a meme recently on the internet within the last few months, several months really. It's taken Reddit by storm. It's taken Twitter and YouTube by storm. A lot of people talking about this. You're the only person I know that's actually read the damn book, though. So, <laughs> really? I would like, yeah, I mean, well, I, have, I don't talk to a lot of people, but I don't talk to a lot of people that would know about this or have read it. So I'm going to cede the rest of our time here to you. I don't have any questions about Baron Trump that I don't think you'll answer throughout the story anyways. But please do tell the listener what this story is, what it's about, and the real life symbolism that exists within it okay i shall tell ye a tale and well first let's get the pink elephant out of the room or the the blonde elephant the, the trump question um we're not talking politics here trump to me is a paranormal subject trump and i by the way share a birthday june 14th is my birthday the same as president odd synchronicity flag day trump's uncle the trump family fortune comes out of the Montauk Project. His uncle was a war profiteer and covered up and profited from te- technologies, including Tesla's papers and the Montauk stuff. We're talking about John Trump, is that right? I believe so. So Trump has a time travel connection in his past. We share a birthday, and I'm connected to the same project. That's interesting. The synopsis is little Baron Trump goes to Russia, and then he he's seeking... The top of the mountain, the well of the giants, or we could say the Nephilim instead of the giants and instead of the well, maybe the doors or he's going to seeking it of all places at the, not the base of a mountain where a well and water would be at the top of the mountain. Another pineal metaphor. He goes inside the mountain through the top and then he enters into the other world and he meets various 19th century Victorian kingdoms, you know, very Jules Verne, um, Wizard of Oz type of stuff. And then Trump helps them along the way. Midway through the story, he stops following a yellow brick road. Well, it's not a yellow brick road. um, It's a white brick road. He gets into a boat. The boat specifically in in the book says it measures five feet by eight feet. And in the end of the book, he comes to the third and final kingdom, which has a huge 
rock crystal singular one rock crystal window, big round window in the side of the mountain, essentially an eye, one eye, and the whole kingdom is frozen in a martial law type of situation. This isn't Baron Trump, but it was overcoming the tyrannical king and queen. And they do it not with a, a fight, not with a big battle like a modern Disney digital bleh, barf fest. It was more about the internal, the power of love overcoming and, and you know, not fighting. The same moral was in, you know, Baron Trump teaches the people the error of their ways. They awaken to a higher consciousness and then he returns to his world. There's a wizard that Baron Trump talks to that multitasks, looks at two or three books at once. What sort of meaning then do you take from the story of Baron Trump? How does it apply to what we're seeing play out in our, on the, sorry? On the world stage with yeah. the President Trump and all that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I've always been a believer in what Terrence McKenna said about the 2012 awakening when everything was, when time would go nonlinear. And if time is not an external energy, like we've been programmed to think, but it's more of a perception, maybe with the awakening, things go nonlinear because we start influencing things. We start changing things. The Baron, the whole Trump phenomenon I had to believe, I could say that I knew, that with the next election that was coming up, meaning the one that just happened when I was thinking about this years ago, something's going to shake this system up. It has to happen. It's not natural to continue the way it's been, broken and stagnant. Back to that whole everything is in constant change. That's natural with our experience in this matrix. I see Trump as a manifestation of just the whole awakening. He is... Speaking truth to power, he's challenging the old establishment. People can love him or hate him, but he has rocked the boat so much we can never go back to the way things were. I don't think it's Trump that got up one day and decided to do it. I think there's many pe on a purely practical level, there's many people behind him. It's a resistance against the globalists. But on a spiritual level or a level, you still there? Hello? Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Hello? Had a weird audio. Oh, we got the echo back now. All right, just Skype reset pause, or something. Just, yeah, as I was say, just pause for just a moment. Yeah, there's a there's a noticeable difference in the audio all of a sudden. Something went. Um, Trump. A lot of people will look at Biff Tannen back to the future and say, "Yeah, uh, uh, that echo is really." Bad. You still hearing is? Hear it at all? I I can't hear anything on my end. I don't know if the the recording looks the same as it as it has always been. So I don't know if it's picking up on the recording. Maybe it'll fade it. Yeah, let's just keep going and just we'll just see what happens. This has been this has been our luck over the past couple of weeks. Okay, those gremlins won't leave us alone. Uh, remember what I told you though. Uh, one reason I'm reluctant to talk is that I'm always seem to be jinxed, but. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Baron Trump, the whole 20th century was this make money, be powerful creature comforts. It's a really rigid uh, mentality to get out of. It's really hard to get out of that. I think embracing that the universe is full of wonderment is the way to go. And, and Trump is just one aspect of that. Is it proof that he's a time traveler or something? I don't even think that's necessary. Others could be that put him in position. Is there paranormal stuff at work? I, I think there has to be at this point. There are too many coincidences for it to be a coincidence. Is Trump himself like setting things up? No, I don't think Trump has a time machine. Oh, that would be awesome if he did. Well, you did mention that uh, John Trump, his uncle, did have access. I mean, he was the guy who took possession of Tesla's papers. So, you but know. I... Go ahead be like the other people i mean maybe they set trump into position they needed like um marty mcfly uh, setting up um his parents to meet you know maybe mm. trump was put into this position but he didn't necessarily initiate it or design it okay so let's just look at this like a back to the future plot so there's a there's a group out there let's say they're working for the betterment of humanity yeah they see the timeline we're on the path that we've charted for ourselves and not you and me or anybody even listening to this podcast but we're talking about the people who chart paths it's not us it's the people with all the power right 
So yeah. they're charting a path for humanity forward that, for example, includes a Hillary Clinton presidency, which would have been awful. <laughs> we would have been in an overt war. We've been in covert wars since the beginning of time, it seems. But we would have definitely been in an, an overt war with Russia and who the hell else yeah. knows. I think once we got into it with Russia, everyone else would be involved, just they would have to be. Right. There's well, two big, I'm not, two superpowers fight that's going to spill over into everybody else. Yeah, I'm not trying to get geopolitical here. But so we go on that timeline and we see that it's really just more of the same. The Clinton dynasty is the Bush dynasty. Obama's part of it, too. We've had the same group in power since. I remember Bush can't remember Bush senior can't remember where he was. Uh. On November 22nd, 1963, even though he was photographed in Dallas that morning. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there was definitely a, a shift with the JFK assassination. But then it seems like it wasn't really a complete takeover until Bush got into the presidency. That seems like when the CIA just started run amok. But they see this timeline. Hillary Clinton is president. This is fucking terrible. This is going to be awful for everybody. So let's put another guy in there. I mean, listen, say what you will about him. He's fucking different. I didn't vote. I don't care. It's all a play to me. It's all theater. It's pro wrestling, as I like to say, and I'm yep. sure that you agree yep. with that. But, Absolutely. But they think, well, here's a guy that we can put in there, though, like you said earlier, that can at least rock the boat a little bit. Now, mm -hmm. the media has a bigger role in this because they're the ones that are pushing the narratives that are out there of racism and really just trying to stir people up to fight each other. While we don't really know what Trump's doing, we know he's playing the game right now, the game that all the other presidents have played. And we know he's playing it for the same type of people. But you're saying that he was put into this position because perhaps his uncle got those Tesla papers, figured out some of the you know secrets to resonance travel or time travel, whatever you want to call it could be people he worked with. He just got the data, and then his friends can make use of it. Well, sure, that's what I'm saying, is that they use this opportunity to steer this narrative into a different direction, to, ch to change or chart a different course. I know if you read the headlines, it seems like, well, it's just more of the same bullshit. However, like you said earlier, more people are waking up to the bullshit, which is what we need. Yeah, so it's changing for the better. Yeah, so if you keep pushing out all of these, obviously, we'll call it fake news to use social media buzzwords. Keep putting out all this fake news. People are going to keep waking up to the fact that this is bullshit. The problem is you still have the division pushed down everybody's throats with Antifa and the alt-right and all this bullshit. It's quieted down a little bit in the last you know week or two, but still, like, you just still have those those divisions pushed, race divisions everywhere. And then you throw up all of these these really weird natural disasters that keep happening, earthquakes on the west coast where you're at, hurricanes in the southeast. It's just there's some weird shit going on right now. No explanation for it. Seems to be man-made bullshit as it usually is. We fuck everything up, or at least we allow people to fuck shit up for us. But it's an interesting correlation that you make to Back to the Future. I rambled there. I'm so sorry. Do you have any thoughts on what I just said? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think I can I can bring all that home in the uh, few minutes we got here. Uh, let's not forget that Hollywood is specialized in mind control. Laurel Canyon, MK Ultra, all that. Could do a whole thing, a whole, a whole few hours on that. But they tell the people what to think. Evil is desperate because it's losing its power. So it's, 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 uh, it's in its death throes and it's thrashing out with its artificial weather. I joke it's Cobra Commander and Destro arguing over the remote control of the weather dominator. They're going to get Trump, you know, but they're, they're just lashing out because they've lost control. And the time machine theory, the, the timeline being altered, I, I think if you think of the stories that we had from, say, Will, Bill Cooper in the 90s and what the original plan was for the New World Order to take out Reagan with Hinckley and have Bush, his vice president, take over eight years earlier, we were supposed to hit the New World Order police state by 2000. They got delayed. Maybe they've done time alterations along the way, kind of like Terminator. They keep postponing it with sequel after sequel. Then there's the John Teeter story where we were supposed to have a quote unquote problem with the election. And then the president, him or her, quote unquote, 
are we at that point? Have they avoided a civil war by altering a timeline and giving us a President Trump? Maybe not a perfect future, but a better one than we better timeline than we would have been on. It's a theory. I can't prove it. But when you consider Trump's uncle, my own bizarre story is to add to the mix. That's proof of something beyond coincidence. Time can be manipulated. Now, I have experienced time slippage. We didn't get into that, but time is not absolute. So if it can be manipulated, it is being manipulated. And my thesis, Indiana Jones, throne of the gods, that was the purpose they wanted the throne so they could see the future timelines and make corrections and get the direction they wanted to go for the betterment of or, or the destruction of the world, depending if the good guys or bad guys got their hands on it. So maybe that's what we're doing. And we're just seeing little echoes of evidence. It's like if you're on a, you know, a, a native seeing a war, you see a big explosion off over the hills. You don't have a context for the rest of the war. We see a Baron Trump book. We see a uh, hear a John Teeter story. There's evidence of timelines being messed with, but we don't have the big picture. So we can't say for certain what's going on. But I think it is more than just geopolitical. There's definitely paranormal forces at work and time travel putting in Trump. I could, I could accept that as real. Yeah. I don't know if we're ready to accept that as real as a society, but it's a fascinating, thought-provoking idea that, shit, I mean, with the way things are going now, with the way they've gone recently, you, I think all ideas are on the table, right? We need something different. You know, we, we need to try something. That's the natural process, to grow, branch in a new direction. Look how a tree grows. Look how a plant grows. If you try and box it in, it kills it. So as a species, as a culture, as a consciousness on this planet, we had to do something radically different. And Trump is definitely radically different. He's destroyed the old media that told us all these years there are no parent. There's no UFOs. Everyone believes the media all of a sudden, but they've been lying to you forever. Magic bullets and weather balloons. Come on. Who's ever believed the media? He's destroyed the old paradigms and left us with a chance to put something new and better in its place. That's up to all of us. People can't expect Trump to wave a magic wand. We all have to be part of it and make something good happen in this, this, uh, take advantage of this opportunity. Yeah, that reminds me of an old quote that I came across when I started writing fiction many years ago that stuck with me. I don't know who said it or where I found it, but the quote was essentially, in order to build a new society, you have to destroy the old one. Uh, that rings true that we have to in many ways, uh, Otherwise, we just continue with the sickness that we've had to continue the problem. What is madness doing the same thing, expecting a different result? We keep electing corrupt politicians. We're not going to get any better. We had to make a change. Absolutely, man. Well, Matt, it's been great having you. I already know I'm going to ask you back because I want to talk some occult symbolism and pro wrestling with you. I think that'd be a great conversation to have. A lot of fun. Absolutely. But... Until then, please do tell people where they can find you on YouTube and anywhere else across the internet that you may want to promote. Uh, YouTube is pretty much it. I have a VidMe account, but I don't put much there because of the time constraints. But I put all my stuff on YouTube. Just look for Matt DeMille, M-A-T-T-D-E-M-I-L-L-E. I don't use a pseudonym. I just want to tell the truth and let people find me. Uh, I have a Facebook as well. Same, you know, Matt DeMille, no pseudonym. And I, I just put everything on YouTube, mostly in audio format, some visual, but they'll be pointed out when they're there. And I just leave the information for people to digest. The library is open. Learn what you can. Well, Matt, it was great chatting with you, like I said, and I wish you well. Thanks for having me, and it's been, it's been a pleasure. So we'll talk soon. Holy Hollywood! My thanks again to Matt DeMille. His YouTube channel is linked in the show notes. Please do check out his videos for more of his commentary on films, current affairs, his own personal paranormal experiences. Matt has some wild stories and claims on there, and I think his insights into film and the inner workings of Hollywood are pretty unique. His commentaries are well worth the time, I think. And I do hope you found this episode well worth your time. It is interesting that the news about Hollywood power player Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein, however the fuck you say his name, it's interesting that the news about him and his, uh, sexual proclivities came out recently. Matt is all too familiar with that sort of behavior. Not shocking news there. The timing is curious, though, all Vegas things considered, and all Awan things considered. Both those subjects deserve some of your time, some independent research, and, uh, a critical think 
Part 2. And speaking of critical, I want to apologize for asking for monetary support during last week's episode with Tracy Rollin. In hindsight, it was a rather shitty thing to do to ask for money in the wake of events like Las Vegas, at least in my opinion. There are more important things than asking or begging listeners to financially support a podcast. I did have that episode with Tracy already edited and recorded when the Vegas event took place. And if I wasn't so lazy, I would have just edited that out or re-recorded that part. I don't know. Money seems quite trivial when you look at the big picture here. And that's not the kind of show that I want to run here. Now that said, I do want to thank David Gutierrez for being the latest to chip in with some support. David's contributing to the show at the astrologer level at $3.33 a month. David, thank you so much for supporting me and this project. Stay vigilant, my friend. And with that, I gotta get out of here. Until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. (laughs) 